both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Uh, Father Stephen Freeman, if you wouldn't mind coming to the podium, we are very blessed to have uh, Father Stephen, who will be delivering a separate talk to everyone at the PLC, he graciously offered to give a talk to our men, uh, tailored to the men in our diocese. So we really appreciate having you, Father Stephen, and I'll give the podium over to you. This concludes our business meeting, and we will now enter the retreat phase. Hats are cool. <laughs> but anyway, let's see here. This thing runs. Actually, the, with the women next door, my wife is doing a talk uh, with the women, and she was concerned that she might hear me while she was doing hers, and it would distract her. And uh, it's been sort of interesting is that she's, she doesn't do talks uh, very much, other than occasional women's retreat or something. And, so uh, I've watched her sweat bullets for the last few months as we've been, and we've been sort of, this started in 2019 that this was going to happen. And she's been thinking about this talk since 2019. And uh, you know, there was COVID, but also there's this thing coming up in Memphis. <laughs> it's like, it, it dwarfed COVID. Uh, but I'm glad to be here. I'm glad that uh, most of us managed to survive and uh, uh, it was a really tough time, a tough time uh, for orthodoxy across America. Uh, I think that the stress of COVID revealed uh, in uh, individual lives uh, some fault lines and fractures. It certainly revealed some fault lines and fractures within orthodoxy uh, in America uh, and across the world. Uh, it, uh, and so there's, there's, in terms of the acquisition of the virtues, we have a great deal of work to do. And uh, the, uh, I thought when we started that the easy way to do this would just be, I mean, that we had the path, as in obey your bishop. Piece of cake, whatever the bishop says, do, do it. And that wasn't uh, apparently sufficient for a lot of people. And uh, we have a lot uh, to learn on these things. Well, the, uh, for about the past oh, six or seven years, I've been working uh, maybe even a little longer than that, been working on a topic in my own life personally uh, on the issue of shame. I have written about it uh, and uh, done some uh, talks on it and, and workshops and stuff. Um, but, and I've just finished uh, a manuscript of, uh, for a book and it's sitting with Ancient Faith and scheduled to come out uh, early 23 on uh, tentatively titled Face to Face uh, the place of shame in the spiritual life. So I'll be talking about that here, and I'll be talking about it again tonight. So uh, anyway, uh, it's tough talking about shame uh, because the very topic of shame can trigger shame. And so if you find yourself feeling, un uh, feeling uncomfortable, uh, just hang in there, we'll do our best. Uh, but I took a, a passage from Scripture to think about today uh, from Matthew 25, something very familiar. Jesus says, For I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, you came to me. Hungry, thirsty, a stranger, naked, sick, and in prison. These are not the desirable qualities or situations in which you want to find yourself, generally. Uh, some of them are more distressing than others, uh, but I thought I would at least share uh, one or two naked stories uh, to get us rolling, uh, because there's fun in that. Uh, I came to Oak Ridge, Tennessee in 1989. I was an Episcopal priest, and it was a large parish, about 800 members, and came in, and it was it was the largest parish I had served. I was a 30, oh, I guess 35, 30, maybe 37 or so years old. And, uh, you know, I wanted to settle in and 
find my way in town and, and you know, be a part of the community. And I discovered that something that a lot of the men did, they were very active in uh, the local. Uh, there was a, a health club that had racquetball, so I got myself a racket, you know. I'd done that a little in college, and I'm gonna go to the health club, and I show up at the health club, and, you know, got my little bag, gym bag with me, and I'm gonna be one of the boys. Uh, and I discovered that after you played racquetball, there was the locker room. And uh, the way, you know, in this sort of a way they were doing things in the locker room, you finished up your workout, and then they had the shower, and basically you put stuff in your locker and went naked to the shower. This is not exactly how I wanted to share uh, with the men of, of Oak Ridge, Tennessee, but I thought, it's not far from this locker to the shower. I can get in and out, dash through, get back, get some clothes on, and get the heck out of here. And uh, anyway, I'm making my way from my locker in the buff uh, into the shower, and there's a hot tub sitting off the, the right at the entrance, beside the entrance of the the shower area, and the former mayor of Oak Ridge, for whom the major park in town is named for him, uh, uh, Bissell Park, as Mayor Bissell, was sitting ensconced in the hot tub. He's a large man, so he's sort of sitting there like Jabba the Hutt. And, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm coming by him, hopefully getting by, and suddenly he looks me just eye to eye, points me out, he said, you're that new preacher. <laughs> and, and just sort of managed to kind of hold me there and force me into a conversation that I did not want to have <laughs> with Mayor Jabba. And, uh, you know, and, and I'm standing there just thinking, this is, please, Jesus, make this brief. And because uh, I have no briefs. And uh, while the city is sort of falling past me into the shower, thinking they're really glad that he had not singled them out. And I thought, please, I don't want to hear about this on Sunday at church, you know. Uh, you know, greeting people at the door, I hear you met the mayor. So anyway. <laughs> The human story also begins with a story of nakedness. Um, Adam and Eve, we're told in scripture, uh, were naked and unashamed. That's how it begins. But no sooner uh, do they sin, than we're told their eyes were opened and they saw they were naked. And it doesn't say, and then they were ashamed, but it tells us a shame reaction. They saw that they were naked and they hid. They went to find fig leaves to cover themselves. They could not bear their nakedness. And it's interesting when God says to them, they're hiding from God, and God says, where are you? And they said, we heard you coming and we were naked, so we hid. And it's very interesting, the conversation, nakedness and hiding is the experience of shame. They did something wrong, and their experience of it was shame, and God changes the conversation. God says to them, who told you you were naked? Did you eat what I told you not to eat? Shame is about the question of who I am, or how I feel about who I am. Uh, Adam and Eve ate and didn't like being Adam and Eve. They needed to hide. They needed to be Adam with a fig leaf, Eve with a fig leaf, Adam in the bushes, Eve in the bushes, not able to face God naked uh, and bear his presence. So they hid. But God changes the conversation and said, did you eat what I told you not to eat? He changes it from who you are, like who told you you were naked? This is not the conversation I want to have. Did you do? He changes it like how I feel about what I did is really the language of guilt. You know, I did something wrong and we can talk about what you did wrong. Uh, and that's almost the easy thing to fix. The difficult thing to fix uh, is how I feel about who I am, the language of shame, because what happens to Adam and Eve is they are now uh, 
they're not comfortable being Adam and Eve. They're separated from themselves. This morning in the homily, uh, I really enjoyed it as he was talking about this innocence of children, the simplicity of the soul. The soul is single in a child. Uh, the Russians have the term dvoyadush, that is to be two souls. Uh, we start moving into a certain direction and find ourselves separated from ourselves. Uh, as we move into adolescence, I'll have a lot to say about that tonight, the experience of adolescence. And many of us throughout our adulthood uh, will carry uh, the painful experience of adolescence as we move into this alienation from the self. That I'm not just me, but I'm me looking at me and not liking what I see. Um, well, Adam and Eve's responses had to do with the experience of shame. Shame is, can be described as an experience of vulnerability, that is feeling uh, exposed, uh, which is why you hide, uh, feeling uh, that something is wrong with me, uh, not just that there's something that I did wrong, but that, you know, it's, it, not only did you do something wrong, but shame is what's wrong with you that you did that, you know? I don't know, do you find yourself when you've done something and you may not have identified it that you're feeling shame, but you're, the words in your head start saying things like, that was stupid. Why did you do that, you idiot? All that language, I mean, I, I probably heard it from an adult earlier on, but I learned to say it to myself, this, this language that is going on. This is the experience of shame. Nobody likes it. Nobody wants it. Uh, we feel not only that we might have done something wrong, but that I am something wrong. Shame has a much more profound meaning as well, particularly in the tradition and teaching of the church. A term that can be used in understanding uh, shame as a healthy thing, because it is, shame uh, actually has a healthy uh, uh, aspect to it. It's not all bad. I, th I think one of my complaints about some of the contemporary uh, writings out there on shame is uh, that it gets treated as that it's always a bad thing, uh, but it's actually, uh, uh, shame itself is inherently good. Uh, there's toxic shame that's bad, but uh, in uh, the book of, um, let's see, that up. Gee, I have to ask Father Stephen. It's one of those. It's one of those books of the Old Testament that's not in the Protestant Bible. Uh, wait a minute, Wisdom of No, it's Sirach. There you go. Sirach, but this is, I mean, your bailiwick, for, you know, but the, uh, in Sirach, it says there is a shame uh, that leads to sin, and there is a shame that is glory and grace. So already uh, in the scriptural tradition, a, a recognition that shame has two sides to it, uh, uh, one that is toxic, that leads to sin, uh, and, but that one uh, that leads to glory and grace. Uh, in uh, the tradition, uh, the best, the, probably the main place to find if you're looking for the topic of shame is to be looking under the topic of humility. Uh, Father Zacharias of Essex, uh, the disciple of St. Uh, Sophroni, describes humility as the ability or the virtue to bear our shame in the presence of God. Now, this is, uh, I think, it, it is a primary virtue of what it is to be a man or a woman. Uh, some clinical theorists, uh, this is interesting, I spent a lot of the time over the last several years in doing research for this book, also reading a ton of clinical material. I wished I had done that under a university, I got another degree, but it just, I just read a ton of stuff and was often surprised to find uh, very secular, even non-Christian writers whose insight as they looked at this place in uh, the human, uh, in our interior, uh, that what they observed lined up with the tradition. But humility is the ability to bear our shame in the presence of God. Some clinical theorists describe shame as the master emotion. 
You enter a room. There's a bunch of people. You've gone to a party. You've been invited to the party, but you don't know everybody there. You, you go in. and I mean, it's really great, these cassock things that we priests have, uh, because you go in and you've got an identity. And so you don't have to feel exactly uncomfortable about your identity. It's a costume. And uh, you can get by with a lot, you know, uh, not only that, but you walk into the room and people will, some of the people may even treat you respectfully uh, if, you've been, if you've gone to the right party. <laughs> you show up at the wrong party, well, that's a bad problem. But um, I got attacked on the, on the streets. I was working at University of Tennessee with our uh, college group and I was, would, I'd parked near a bar on campus and I'm coming back in my cassock to my car and there's a, several guys with some girls that had obviously been in the bar too long. And uh, it's East Tennessee. They were, not, they were Protestant bar guys. And uh, drunks come in all kinds of shapes, right? And these were Protestant drunks. And so they saw me and the, one of the guys starts just cussing me out and saying bad things about Catholic priests. And I thought, you know, one of my thoughts was to defend myself and to explain, because he was saying a lot of things about the proclivities of Catholic priests sexually, and uh, at least things he assumed about them. And I part of wanted to say, I'm an Orthodox priest, I'm married, but you know, then I thought, I'm not gonna say a thing. And I just took it and uh, managed to see if I could get around him and get in my car without getting beaten up, uh, which I did. I mean, uh, Fortunately, I wasn't wearing like an Alabama sticker or anything like that, that that you could actually get hurt for. But um, later that week, I told the Catholic priest in town, I took one for your team this week. And, uh, and I think you owe me a beer, you know, <laughs> at least one. But the, the shame is the master emotion. Uh, you go into the room and uh, you don't know it, but shame has gone with you in the room. It's, it's the master emotion. It's checking out what to do. Are they drinking? What are they doing? How are they talking? How are they behaving? All of these questions that go in your mind about how should I behave in the party, it's shame without even thinking it, is checking each emotion before it even allows you to have it. Um, it's very interesting how the dynamic of that goes. St. Anthemus of Chios said, humility, uh, that humility is the source of all the virtues, that humility will bring all the virtues. So if the project of the Antiochian men is to acquire virtue, you will do it through humility. Humility brings all the virtues. God resists the proud. And he gives grace to the humble. Um, so today I want to drill down into what this practice of humility, the practice of bearing a little shame, in the words of St. Sophroni, what it looks like. Uh, shame is, I think, much easier and, more, and a more profitable way to gain an understanding of humility. Uh, it's it, it, it kind of opened up the whole topic to me. Um, and in our culture, we often take the meaning of humility as being humble, uh, meaning not boasting about my excellence. You know, I mean, like you sit down and you just play the piano beautifully, just ripped off, you know, one of Rachmaninoff's little things or something, and it's just been flawless, and you stand up and something, someone pays you a compliment for how well you played the piano, and you go, oh, thank you, thank you, you know, it's nothing. And uh, it, anybody can be humble like that. Um, humility is not about being humble about our excellence. I mean, a little training in good manners can handle that. That's, that's not the thing. Humility as expounded in the fathers is more about our ability to bear our failures. Uh, I'm gonna take us into a little story from book four of the latter of divine Ascent, St. John of the Ladder. Uh, taken from this, he said, Terrible indeed was the judgment of a good judge and shepherd that I once saw, them, saw in a monastery. For while I was there, it happened that a robber applied uh, for admission to the monastic life 
and that most excellent pastor and physician, the abbot of the monastery, ordered him to take seven days of complete rest and just to see the kind of life they led. Interesting, okay. So when the week had passed, the abbot called him and asked him privately, would you like to live with us? And when he saw that he agreed to this with all sincerity, he, he then asked him what evil he had done in the world. And he saw that he readily confessed everything. He tested him a little further. He said, I want you to tell this in the presence of the brethren. Ooh, not just confession, but a little public confession. Uh, and he said, but he really did hate his sin and scorning all shame without the least hesitation, he promised to do it. He said, and if you like, I will tell it in the middle of the city of Alexandria. Just put me on a street corner and I'll confess to the world. So the shepherd gathered all the sheep in the church to the number of 230. And during the divine liturgy, for it was Sunday, after the reading of the gospel, he introduced this irreproachable convict. They had him dragged by several of the brethren uh, who gave him moderate blows. I've always wondered what that meant or looked like, but you've got several stout monks dragging this guy into the assembly, beating him. I like that. This is sort of a new way for your catechumen program. <laughs> you want to be a catechumen? No. <laughs> we're, we're beating some this Sunday. And, uh, he gave him moderate blows. They had his hands tied behind his back and he was dressed in a hair shirt. His head was sprinkled with ashes. This would work. This is really, this, is, this would work. Anyway, so they, and everybody was astonished at the sight and immediately a woeful cry rang out for no one knew what was happening. So then when the robber appeared at the doors of the nave, the, the abbot who had such a love for souls, said to him in a loud voice, Stop! You're not worthy to enter. <sighs> Dumbfounded by the voice of the shepherd coming from the sanctuary, the abbot was in the altar, for he thought, as he afterwards assured us with oaths that he had heard, not a human voice, but thunder. He said he instantly fell on his face, trembling and shaking all over with fear. And as he lay on the ground, moistened the floor with his tears, the wonderful physician, the abbot, using every means for this man's salvation and wishing to give everyone an example of saving and effectual humility, again exhorted him in the presence of all to tell in detail what he had done. And with terror, he confessed one after another all his sins, which revolted every ear. Not only sins of the flesh, natural and unnatural, y'all hold your ears, natural and unnatural with rational beings and with animals, but even poisoning, murder, many other kinds which it's indecent to hear or commit to writing. I'm kind of thinking, well, what were the things you didn't write down? But anyway, and when he had finished his confession, the shepherd at once allowed him to be given the monastic habit and numbered among the brethren. Amazed, St. John writes, amazed by the wisdom of that holy man, I asked him when we were alone, why'd you make such an extraordinary show? That true physician replied for two reasons. Firstly, in order to deliver the penitent himself from future shame by present shame and it really did that, Brother John, for he did not rise from the floor until he was granted remission of all his sins. And don't doubt this, for one of the brethren who was there confided to me, saying, I saw someone terrible, an angel, holding a pen and, writing, and a writing tablet, and as the man told each sin, the angel crossed it out with a pen. So anyway, he said, but secondly, because there's others in the brotherhood who have unconfessed sins, and I want to induce them to confess too, for without this, no one will obtain forgiveness. And then later in the chapter, he said, sometimes you can only heal shame by shame. You can only heal toxic shame by healthy shame. You can only heal shame by shame. So we could restate that and say that you can only heal shame by humility. But humility 
uh, will require a number of things in order to be nurtured in our life. If this is, in fact, the fount of all the virtues, how do we nurture it in his life? I've chosen Christ's words from Matthew 25 to help us think through some practical matters of humility as we learn to bear a little shame. For I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was stranger, you took me in. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And most commonly, we take those words, I can think of all these sermons I've preached year in and a year out with it, take these words and we apply them to people around us. You need to clothe the naked, feed the hungry, all those things, visit the prisoners and the sick, and uh, we take that mandate to serve the needy. Uh, and with the wonderful revelation that Jesus has that says that in doing this thing for these, the least of these, my brethren, you're actually doing it to him. He is so entered into them that as we serve others, we are mystically serving Christ himself. But I want to use these verses in a different way today, remembering that the common application still remains true. So I'm not trying to do anything new, just giving us a bit of a different lens. So my suggestion is going to be twofold. First, the conditions, hungry, thirsty, strangers, naked, sick, and in prison, can also be understood as conditions of our own soul. Conditions of the truth of who we are. I mean, it's not particularly a matter of shame for us to serve people like that. In fact, it can be a matter of pride. Um, we use phrases like the less fortunate to describe them. My experience through the years surrounding this kind of ministry has been interesting. One conclusion has been this. If you are poor and you need help, your best chance will be to go to someone else who is poor. I have found this year after year in place after place. I've seen astounding acts of generosity in exactly those circumstances. Of course, the middle class and above have a lot more resources, but the chances are very great that if you go to the middle class for help, they will want to manage you. They will help you, but they want to manage the help. I mean, the bottom line is that they believe that they know what you need better than you do. It's management. And that's sort of a, a curse of those of us who get by in America. Everybody in America is in management. You notice? I mean, heck, I had no idea so many people were experts in the management of a pandemic. Uh, you know, uh, church management, uh, health things, experts on viruses. Uh, it's amazing, you know, we're always, every four years, we're experts on economic matters, uh, political matters, we know everything, you know, we know how to fix America, uh, we love management. Um, but oftentimes the poor discover is they go to those that they think have the resources only to discover what they want is management. I was serving that church in, in, in Oak Ridge where I was the Episcopal priest, I served there for nine years. We started a daycare center for the children of unwed mothers uh, next door at the high school. We partnered with the school system and had this ministry. The idea was if we take care of their kids, they can go to school. And if they get a high school degree, uh, uh, education, they'll have better options in their life. And we set it up with the school district and I set it up so that we both had mutual veto power. I could veto and they could veto. Part of my veto was to guarantee that they didn't do anything that encouraged abortions. That was my ulterior motive uh, in that. But we had a number of people from uh, the, the uh, community who sat on our board, including a couple of women from the League of Women Voters, who was generally a league of, do, doing good, of women doing good. And uh, God save us. And, um, I remember having a big battle when they wanted to institute a rule that if a, one of the girls in our program who had a child in our program, if they got pregnant again, would be kicked out of the program. And I thought, so then if they get an abortion, they can keep their child in daycare, and that's a payoff. And I said, no. 
I told him, I said, you know, 50, over 50% of all black children in our city are conceived out of wedlock. You're just white women trying to tell black women how to run their lives. They don't need you doing that. I said, did you know most of their pregnancies are planned? And you think it's all accidents, you're just, your mind is somewhere else. But it was amazing to me how often I had to fight to keep them wanting to fix the girls. They wanted to fix the girls. And me, I'm the priest. And I thought, no, the girls getting a high school degree is all we're trying to make possible for them. And then let them live their lives. Um, but as I say, we want to manage people. We think we control the outcome of history. Tragically, this drive to fix and correct focuses always on the other and neglects the soul wounding effects of the unattended shame in our lives that is there for truth. You are hungry. You are thirsty. You are the stranger. You are naked. You are sick. You are in prison. Uh, this is something that is true of me. It's true of you. Uh, they're true of us. And we seek to hide from them, to deny them. Uh, you know, I see this example in our internet world all the time. You think of the argument you see out there. Our souls get stirred up. For instance, I, I, this will happen in our orthodox world. Uh, one of our orthodox leaders might do something wrong, some faux pas or even major doctrine line or something happens and I just, just there's an explosion uh, out there. Uh, the, and uh, we fail uh, to deal, I mean, the truth is, is that if an Orthodox leader does something wrong, I'm ashamed. You know, if a brother priest does something wrong, I'm ashamed. If a brother layman does something wrong, I'm ashamed. And suddenly, instead of attending first off to the shame within me, I reach out to want to fix, to manage, to control. It oftentimes comes out as anger. Um, and, you know, it's, there's just this energy uh, out there and nothing, uh, nothing good comes of it. We fail to speak uh, of the soul of shame that inspires actions that way. For example, um, we don't weep. We see these things, we react. We don't weep, we don't lament, we don't bear the pain of our souls to God so that he could comfort us nor do we rightly bear our shame to one another. I mean, I, I, I've gone through this this past year, uh, these past few months, uh, it, as we got all internet excited uh, over the war going on in Ukraine. I told somebody, this is like telling me that my uncle is beating my aunt. I feel terrible about it. This is my family. This is my family, and there's, there's problems, and I grieve. But oftentimes what you want to do is to write letters and get, you know, get out there and show our colors and pick sides and do all of this instead of weeping because we're broken. We're broken. Our orthodox world is broken. God allows our orthodox world to be broken. Um, I like, I've gotten to where with, with uh, catechumens who come into orthodoxy now, I warn them. That if you're going to become orthodox, if you want to be excellent, I tell them, become a Protestant because they're always reinventing the church. Uh, every mistake they made in the last one, they invent a new one that doesn't have that mistake and the pendulum swings back and forth. With orthodoxy, we have 2,000 years of mistakes. I mean, the New Testament was written to churches with mistakes. If they hadn't have been broken, Paul wouldn't have needed to write anything. Um, and the churches are still at the same address and are probably still doing pretty much the same things. We read their mail because it's so fitting to us. We keep doing that. You know, uh, orthodoxy is the honesty of 2,000 years of Christian history that includes the shame of 2,000 years of Christian history. Uh, and I think we, we make mistakes when we try to come up with theories to talk about how perfectly excellent we are. 
No, we're the miracle church. 2,000 years of the nonsense we've engaged ourselves in with one another, and we're still here, still struggling to love one another. You know, still struggling to love one another. Orthodox, Orthodox ecclesiology is like a marriage. If a husband and wife don't love each other, it doesn't work so well. If the patriarchs do not love one another, they will wind up out of communion. You know, it's, but at least we're vulnerable to that uh, because that's the reality and the truth. God uh, created the church in order to save us, not in order for us to lord it over everybody else and tell them how excellent we are. The church, in my experience, reveals our brokenness again and again and again. Uh, just in the life of a parish. I've started missions from scratch. I've had the uh, opportunity to be involved with five different startups in Orthodox churches. And if you can just survive the first 10 years, you know, it takes a unique group of people to start a mission. And it can, sometimes the personalities have a hard time making it past the 10 year point. It, there's just difficulties. Uh, they eat, we eat priests. We wear them out. We put them in mission situations. They're underpaid, overworked. It's difficult. Um, and so this is, this is uh, as the elder Sophroni taught, he said, the way of shame is the way of the Lord. I've seen the internet meme that says, Orthodox, the Marines of Christianity. And I think, the orthodox, the few, the proud. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. No, no. We're not the Marines of Christianity. Uh, no. The way of shame is the way of the Lord. He encouraged, St. Sophroni encouraged the practice of what he said was bearing a little shame. He told uh, Father Zacharias when he was first being uh, blessed to hear confessions, he said, teach them, especially the young, but teach, teach them to bear a little shame. Uh, that is an emphasis, for me, an emphasis on the word little. You know, we don't all have to start off like the robber in the monastery with the deepest, darkest, most awful secrets, but a little. Uh, Father Seraphim, a uh, Romanian monk who started uh, the monastery that's in Scotland on the Isle of Mole, he told me that his Romanian uh, priest confessor told him, when you come to me in confession, he said, be sure to tell me something that you think will make me think less of you. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. Those are the worst things. The, uh, I remember uh, the late Archbishop Dimitri of blessed memory saying once to me, he said, you know, I still hate going to confession. And I thought, he must have learned how to really do it. <laughs> Such, you really do it is hard. The ability to bear shame is pretty much impossible without a safe environment. And this is something I would say uh, as important uh, for uh, a group of men. Um, the healing of the soul that requires that we're able in some sense to stand naked before God uh, and therefore in some sense to stand naked before others uh, a question comes up, just how safe are they? You know, If it's not safe, you know, then I don't need to tell you nothing if you're not safe. I mean, a priest and all the rules surrounding confession uh, seek to try to make confession safe so that you can trust it, so you can trust the priest. If there is spiritual abuse occurring in a parish, and it does happen, Almost invariably, almost invariably, it is an abuse of shame where a priest is using uh, or abusing things like confession uh, or other things to manipulate and control people uh, through shame. It's a very powerful weapon. Parents can do the same things, the shaming of children, in which you, uh, instead of deal, help a child deal with something they did wrong, giving them the message that there's something about them that they themselves are wrong. Uh, that language uh, is a language uh, that lives on in their life 
those messages, the tapes of those messages will play for years. Uh, Father Hans noted that our culture is being a very difficult place to be a man. Uh, to be a man. Our culture is shaming what it is to be male. Uh, being, you, you know, you get special sins so that you are uh, toxic masculinity. I mean, you know, just you get special names that way. You, um, you know, you're a predator, all kinds of things uh, that are there, uh, and it just makes it difficult. That message has trickled down. Uh, our children, uh, young, young boys, are feeling increasingly, I mean, they're getting, they don't know how to be male. Uh, and if they're living in a culture, in a lot of youth culture, especially if it's like TikTok youth culture uh, and other sorts of social media, is trickling down a message that doesn't have a model for being male. So unsurprising, a lot of the little males want to be little girls or other more confused things. Or it just kind of, it's, they're trying to work out identity and identity is inherently a question of shame. I mean, if shame answers the question, how do I feel about who I am? My identity is at the root of that. Who am I? You know, our little boys need men who are comfortable being men. And, and allowing them to know that that's something you can grow up and be, and it's not toxic, it's not bad. You're not, you know, you didn't create all the evil in the world. I know I'm preaching to the choir on this, uh, but, you know, that's why we're here. Uh, preach to the choir every Sunday. But on the other hand, male culture can be toxic. It can be toxic. Um, we joke a lot. Uh, I've, I've noticed this as I pay attention. I've got three daughters and one son and got a wife. And you pay attention to male culture and female culture. I mean, men, we will joke with each other about that you're, you're getting fat. We don't mind doing that. You know, you look like you picked up a few, you know. Uh, we'll crack jokes about your male member being too small. Oh, look how little your hands are, you know. We do those things. We do those things. Women never do that. Women, ne uh, one woman will never say to another, you know, you, you, I think you've picked up a few. They never do that. They have other games they play. There's women's shame games. But that ain't one of them. Uh, we men, we can do that. This sort of, um, back when I was an Episcopal priest, it began when I was in seminary, it was a very male culture. Like, it is an orthodoxy, all male priesthood. Then while I was in it, they started ordaining women. I remember going to a meeting of male priests, but there was one woman priest was there, and I was giving her a ride home, and she said, you know, that was strange. I said, how that? She says, I felt I should have a sword and a shield. And I thought, well, welcome to the, to the club, sister. But, um, I mean, it's male. But we, we oftentimes, you know, not all of us are alphas. Uh, and oftentimes hidden in our games of sort of comparison and things that we do with one another, there's a hidden message, there's a power game going on, and the alphas are establishing the pecking order. You know, and if you're a, I mean, if you're a beta uh, in one form or another, uh, you can feel uh, a little less than welcome, um, you know, one more time uh, that your inadequacies are uh, showing up. St. Paul, St. Paul, was very clear about this, that we are not saved by our excellence. I'm translating this into modern speak. Uh, he would talk about his strength, uh, that I will boast instead, he said, of my weakness, not of my strength. Uh, those who are excellent don't need a savior or don't think they need a savior. It's in our weakness uh, and our brokenness that we're able to call out for God uh, and to find him. And so in that sense, as Sophronius says, that the way of shame is the way of the Lord. Jesus himself took the way of shame. In Philippians 2, uh, when Paul talks about the humility of Christ on the cross, he says, in died the death, even death on the cross, 
He doesn't mean even death on the cross because it was painful. Actually, there are more, many more painful ways to die uh, than a cross. Uh, you know, f- being flayed alive, that's one of them. Uh, but uh, many more things are painful. The cross is not uh, extraordinary for pain. It's extraordinary for shame. Uh, if you listen to the text of Holy Week, uh, most of the texts in Holy Week are about the shame and the mocking, not about pain. We don't dwell on the nails. We don't dwell on the spear. We dwell on, I turn not my face from the shame and the spitting. This is what this is. And, and for us, this is, Jesus has entered into that weakest point for all of us, this place that Adam and Eve were in when they hid. He has gone into that hidden place, the secret place of shame in our lives. Um, There were things that happened to me as a child, and I'll not share them with you all because I'm already in the brethren. (laughs) I'm not a catechumen today. But anyway, (laughs) there were things things that happened to me as a child that I probably should have mentioned to to in confession. uh, And... I had been making confession since my 20s, uh, even as an Anglican, uh, but I never mentioned in confession until I was 58 years old, which was sort of a time of crisis in my life uh, when I came into the topic of shame and realized that I had things that I needed to go find out about and go into and bring them into light, at least with a confessor. Um, You'd be surprised of what's there for us. Uh, those who suffer from depression, anxiety, uh, and many other disorders uh, can oftentimes discover that at the heart of many disorders like that, uh, there is shame that has not been identified and not been attended to. It's true for men. It's true for women. Uh, what's true of the innocence and purity of soul that we find in our children uh, is that they begin without shame. We begin with an innocence. And as Christ calls us to be as little children, there's an invitation to heal us and to help us slowly return to the integrity of soul, the unity of soul, the wholeness. um, That it doesn't mean the shame's gone away because the stuff is still there um, in some way. I mean, what happened happened, but the ability to, to bear it. Um, I remember in my conversations with uh, Father Zacharias in Essex asking them, so what do you do with it? What do you do with the shame when you find it? And he turned to the word comfort. And he took me through a long list of scriptures about how God wants to comfort us. And interestingly, the Holy Spirit is called the comforter. Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will give you another comforter. Children need comfort you know and it's a wrong masculinity that says I don't need comfort yes you do Uh, that little boy in you does you know that little boy who wanted his daddy and his daddy wasn't there who hungers for the society of other men and they're not there he needs comfort and he says sit in the presence of God and pray oh God Comfort me. Oh, God, comfort me. It's something that I've learned to do uh, in, before my icon corner at home uh, or to go into the altar at church uh, to work as I'm preparing myself to make my confession, to sit with it and pray, Oh, God, comfort me. Do you know I don't want to talk about these things, these vulnerabilities, these these personality quirks that I have that embarrass me, that get me in trouble, that, that are just, that I'm sure everybody can see them. <laughs> and, you know, oh God, comfort me. It, Jesus is so kind to his disciples. He does not shame them. He comforts them. What a, what a genuine comfort Jesus is with Peter after the resurrection. He doesn't say, I told you you would deny me. Oh, I knew you. That's just who you are. You're a denier. Nothing like that. Instead, Peter, do you love me? And Peter's just just seething with shame. You know, you can just hear it in every word he says. 
Lord, you know I love you. And he can't even say agape. He can't say that. He knows he's not worthy of the word agape. You know I feel you. I love you. Peter, do you fillet me? Do you love me? My friend, Lord, you know I love you. know everything. You know I love you. But he's, he keeps giving him his ministry back. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll close with this thought. With Adam and Eve, the most marvelous thing is not just that God did not shame them, but helped them deal with what was really going on. But when it's all said and done, it says he covered them with garments of skin. Oh, the fathers did amazing things with that. The garments, I mean, all kinds of things. So what do the garments of skin mean? Uh, I always call them Flintstone, Flintstone outfits, uh, you know. And, uh, but the, that's not quite what the fathers would do with them. Uh, but if you look at the work of God throughout the whole of our life, there's a whole theme in scripture of clothing us. So much so that we get to baptism. You've enrobed me with a robe of righteousness. As many as have been baptized in Christ have put on, have clothed themselves in Christ. Hallelujah. Uh, not to be found uh, with my own righteousness, but to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ, or even in the resurrection. Uh, not that I should put off this mortal body, but that I might be clothed in immortality. This theme, the whole thing of the priest. What the most wonderful moment, I think, in our lives, as so many of in you. Uh, to, to stand in front of a crowd of people with your father in God, the bishop, who's putting clothes on you. He's, as a bride, adorned herself with jewels. It's, it's your wedding day. Oh, he, so my God has adorned me. And the bishop says, Oxios. And I, I was, you know, to stand in front of a bunch of a room and have a bunch of people shouting that you're worthy, you know, um, I was. I've got a chapter in my book that talks about clothing and the bride. I've, I've tried to give a word to young men to understand that it's really all about the gown. It's the bridal gown. I've had three daughters get married. That's what it's about. It's about the bridal gown, and the bridal gown. Don't think of it as frivolous. It's as important as the vestments of a priest. It's the vestments of a bride. Every culture has them. You know, the, the dressing of a bride is a very, I mean, in some cases she's wearing her entire dowry, you know, jangling coins, the whole thing. You know, uh, we want to be clothed this way. Um, I like the custom in some churches that those who are newly baptized or even chrismated are clothed in a white robe. Uh, the clothing is important. This is something we need to be doing with one another as we build up the virtues, uh, helping one another bear shame because humility will attract and build up the virtues. We need to clothe one another. I need to clothe you with forgiveness. I need to clothe you with safety so that you can be and know the comfort of God and the comfort of the brotherhood. Uh, we need to, to, to clothe one another, not with shame, uh, but with an honest uh, and godly glory. Um, you know, uh, just being able to talk about good things about men, I mean, it's life giving because you don't get that message outside of here. They try to clothe us with shame when God would clothe us with glory. So, God give us grace uh, to bear the shame. I mean, the nice thing is, I mean, it's just honestly true, is that the more you're able to do that, um, the world will not have power over you. This is the primary way the world seeks to control us, seeks to control us. And instead, uh, to be clothed by Christ, stay in Jerusalem, and to be clothed with power. God give us Christ to be clothed with power. And the power of Christ is his humility. The power of Christ is the cross the weakness of cross that offers that to God. So uh, thank you for having me today. Uh, I appreciate that and uh, hope these words uh, were helpful. And uh, so let me close us with a prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, O Christ God, who has clothed us with your own righteousness, clothe our hearts with humility, 
Give us a heart of courage to stand before you as we are, naked and unashamed, without fear, that we might know you and see you face to face, and beholding you face to face, see ourselves as we truly are. And to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever and into ages of ages. Amen. But trusting the compassion of thy mercy, I shall to thee like David have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy great mercy. See?